Before history is written, it's played. Before it's frozen in time, it's fought one shift at a time. Before it's etched in silver, it's carved in ice. What happens next will last forever. The Stanley Cup Final on ABC and ESPN Plus begins Saturday. Auto insurance can all seem the same until it comes time to use it. So don't get stuck paying more for less coverage. Switch to USA Auto Insurance and you could start saving money in no time. Get a quote today. Restrictions apply. USAA. I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city on earth. Bop, bop, boom. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of The Most Haunted City on Earth. My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And we are here today with Sheila. Hello. Yes, Sheila is joining us to talk about haunted Savannah theaters and theaters in general. Yes. Um, and so we're going to have lots to discuss today because I have many questions on this topic. <laughs> um, but Good yes. Job. So before we get into that, um, we do have a few announcements for y'all today. Uh, first, we want to thank some new para junkies. Uh, my first one is Sheila. Is that you? That's okay, you. great. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you, my boy. You're welcome. <laughs> welcome. That is that. possibly the most direct uh, thank you we've ever had. To, you know. I feel honored. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, thank you, Sheila. You're welcome. And uh, we want to thank Jason, Ashley A W, CB CBXTR. Elise and Audrey or Adri. Thank you so much y'all for joining us over on the Para Junkie side. Uh, we have a lot of really fun content coming, uh, especially with Waverly Hills coming up, which all of y'all know, unless you're new here and this is the first episode that you're hearing. We're going to Waverly Hills in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, we're going to go spend a night in a giant uh, tuberculosis hospital. Abandoned one. So Joined by the Ghost Brothers. Joined by the Ghost Brothers. The Gross Brothers. The Gross Brothers. Yes, we are joining uh, the Ghost Brothers as well, and we are going to have so much fun with that. We're going to film all night. We're hopefully, fingers crossed, going to live stream all night. Uh, as much as possible. As much as possible because for the para junkies. So, um, good reason to become a para junkie. Exactly. Another good reason to become a para junkie is JT and I next week are going to be going to a wedding in Houston, which is your clue. Um, but I won't give you exactly where we're going to be going to, but we're going to do an exclusive para junkie um, investigation of oh. sorts over in Texas. So, I'm actually going to San Francisco and I'll be at the Winchester house. Oh, what? I'm so jealous. So jealous. And Alcatraz. Oh, my God. Not so jealous. Well, we're going to have lots of great stories from so that. We'll plenty of great stories. I'll bring my, my, crazy, uh, my crazy gimbal camera. Yes. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure Megan will enjoy being in those, <laughs> in those spaces. She's very excited about the Winchester house. Yes. Oh, I, that, I mean, how could you not be? It's amazing. I'm very jealous of that. But anyways, <laughs> it's not about that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> neither here nor there. But neither... Uh, yes, so we the schedule. Uh, the schedule drops early April. For the pair I know. I didn't we're hear going to saying. we're going to have a Waverly Hills schedule, yes. and okay. it will be presented in early April, just so you would see the hour to hour breakdown of what we're attempting to accomplish, uh, barring any strange events that might occur once we're there. Because a lot of the times we are making these plans based on what we anticipate doing, but sometimes things like wire wireless connectivity. <laughs> um, uh, uh, the motions of both because we have two full investigative groups there at the same time and we cross paths and what we learned at the conjuring house is that in order for each of us to accomplish what we want to do sometimes we have to be out of a certain area so uh, we will have a schedule that'll give you a, a brief overview of what we're going to be doing 
on uh, on on our evening, and that's uh, April twenty fourth. Yes, April twenty fourth. April twenty fourth in uh, Waverly Hills Sanatorium in Louisville, Kentucky. Yes. So sorry about that, Debria. <laughs> 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 Don't uh, edit that out. That's that's fine. It's that's perfect. That's fine. That's totally normal. My favorite normal. thing is that uh, JT doesn't have a mic, so what you're here is. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a peanuts <laughs> episode. Yeah, exactly. It's like some distant voice from far away trying to tell us something. Well, we're getting a message. <laughs> yeah. Do you hear it? <laughs> Yeah, the other reason why sometimes our plans get pulled awry is if you remember with the Conjuring House, sometimes little kid spirits are like, go outside, That's look true. at the sky. And we, we want to like, follow any instruction that we might receive through our uh, Estes methods or, or any other methods that might be telling us to do things. So. Exactly. But really, so you have to be a little wise, though. No, it's, no, it's, it's very wise. rarely <laughs> wise to do so, but it's, it's good content. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. Well, let's get into haunted theaters. Absolutely. Um, and Sheila was very gracious to come in today, even though she's feeling under the weather. It's the season for allergies and colds, and which one is it? Who knows? So who knows? For those of you who are only listening, um, if Sheila sounds a little like um, uh, a superhero, it's because she is wearing a mask. <laughs> <laughs> covering her face, yes. and so she, she doesn't normally sound like that. Uh, she I is mean, just protecting us from from opinion, airborne yeah. illness. <laughs> exactly. I have heard you speak, this and you generally don't sound quite as Super. superhero-y. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. Exactly. Well, uh, Sheila, can you give us a little bit of your background yes. when we get started with So this? I have been working in and around theaters since high school, uh, for sure. Um, and back in those days, I didn't believe in ghosts because I grew up in a Catholic family and it was very much discouraged. But I loved supernatural stories, the paranormal, all of that. So, you know, eventually I was going to trip over one. And so the theater in my hometown of Alpena, Michigan, uh, Thunder Bay Theater, very haunted quite haunted the whole area i mean alpina was an old logging town in like the 1700s i mean michigan's got lots of older history lots of indigenous history and an anthropology professor of mine talked about the specific parcel of land that that theater sat on was definitely had artifacts that they had found when they were building the post office the building that the theater was in was 18 you know 19th century mid 19th century dry goods stores it was you know two stories but um i didn't believe until things started occurring and happening to me you know weird footsteps that we'd hear you know you know people aren't upstairs and you'd hear like footsteps things rolling down the hallway um the theater has had its share of tragedy recently from two fires um so you know there's there's, it's kind of sad about that. And, you know, I know they're trying to raise funds to get it back on its feet. But that was what kind of, like, awoke my senses of, what, you know, why, what, you know, h- how can I dis, dis, you know, disbelieve this when I heard it, things happened, you know, I've seen weird myths and photos, yada, yada, yada. So then I went to... Uh, undergrad at Western Michigan University and worked in the theater there. And for one of my senior projects, I had to paint a very large scrim that was like 30 feet by 15 feet. And the only time I could do it was overnight when none of the crews were there. And I was completely by myself, locked in the building. And, you know, the Shaw Theater was built, I think, in like the 40s or 50s. And there were rumors. And it was just one of those things where, you know, when all of us in college dabbling with the occult and like getting <laughs> into it and whatnot and so what else is college for <laughs> right <laughs> but it was one of those feelings of like someone is sitting in the theater i know they're watching me i'm just gonna be very loud about i'm just here to paint this thing please don't mess with me you know and just going about my business um but once I moved to Savannah, um, I started working for the Savannah College of Art and Design, um, housed in Trustees Theater, have worked in both Trustees and the Lucas, have been to the Savannah Theater and did a lot of work with what started as Savannah Actors Theater and eventually became the Muse Arts Warehouse. Right. And um, 
went back to Michigan in 2017 and uh, was an executive director for a local auditorium that was owned by the city of Sturgis, the Sturgis Young Center for the Arts. And in all of my time, in all of my theater experience, I've never been in a theater that didn't have <laughs> resident ghosts, resident ghost stories. I've I've talked to some of my theater friends about like what what stories do you have? And some are like, eh, you know, it's it's you know, made up or whatnot, or if there are ghosts, they're happy, like the Lucas Theater. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Which was built in and opened in nineteen twenty six. Mm -hmm. I mean Savannah's Savannah. And and it's a grand old movie house. It yeah. was, it was yeah. its original. Camille purpose. was one of the yeah. first screenings. Um, you know, Arthur Lucas probably spent more time there than anywhere else. He dedicated his life to it. Yeah, really. mm -hmm. Savannah. The Savannah Theater is one of the oldest, longest running theaters. It is Eastern's the longest continually running active uh, theaters. Active theaters. Um, there's one because there have been plenty that are older, but they've been shut down for long right. periods of time, right. and they may have come back, or they were re refurbished. Re but the theater has been on that site since 1818 and has continuously served as a theater since 1818. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then Trustees Theater, which was uh, built in the 40s, was the Wise Theater. The Wise Theater, yeah. And that family owned the Savannah Theater. Before. That is correct. As a matter of fact, the Wise of... Um, the uh, Trustees Theater is also a ghost that they believe can be found both at Savannah Theater and the Trustees Theater. Yes, and I don't doubt that. Although <laughs> the renovation of Trustees in 2013 has kind of dampened any kind of... You That's know, an interesting interest. thing yeah. To, yeah. To, really, yeah. to discuss as well. Well, and I mean, you know... It, it, before the rent, so it reopened. It, it closed in the seventies with a screening of The Exorcist. Yes, yes, it did. Very telling. Um, the there was a radio station that operated out of there for a while, and then uh, Scab bought it in the mid nineties and restored it, and opened in ninety seven with a Tony Bennett tribute and whatnot. And it was. Um, Decorated in a very Art Deco style, yep. so red velvet walls. Mm -hmm. um, they reupholstered the seats, so the seats were original. They were very, very squeaky, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, and it was. It had a really great Art Deco look to it, and the lobby was really lovely. And in 2013, it was kind of um, switched over to a much more modernist, brutalist type style yeah. so it's a little more lecture holly now and it functions well it's got good still has good acoustics the scad savannah film festival you know yeah. operates out of mm -hmm. both of them every year which i you know help curate but um prior to the renovation um i was aware of specific incidences that would occur and be brought to my attention like i never really felt anything mm -hmm. um and just for for listeners sake it was in college where i became aware that i was more sensitive um at first i just thought that it was just a normal like oh you know weird shutters but it it feels like the ice bucket challenge for me oh, when no. yeah <laughs> you know in varying degrees mm -hmm. when there are whatever presence is trying to make themselves known to me. Sometimes it's very subtle, like a tap on the shoulder, like, hello, hello, hello. And sometimes it's very insistent, and sometimes it's just like, <laughs> you are now freezing cold. So um, I didn't really experience that a lot in Trustees Theater or the Lucas. But um, stories would be brought to my attention by certain people who were there and had seen a gentleman in a top hat and a longer coat, uh, walk through the wall into the alley. And they were very, th this person relaying the story was very visibly upset. And they were just, you know, adamant that I saw him and he was, he didn't, I, I, there was nobody in here. And then he was there and then he wasn't, you know. Um, a group of school children had seen a similarly described gentleman in the green room area. And uh, one of my friends at one point when we were locking up after a film festival event was like, who's that gentleman that just walked by in a white shirt? And I was like, what? gentleman and we walked the entire house and there was no gentleman and you can move through that theater fast enough to be able to like find right. someone right. so there's only so many ways you can travel right. through the right. theater so right. you know if you found somebody in, in in like the side hall 
it would be easy to cut them off. <laughs> yes, <laughs> trustees is not labyrinthian. No, at not all. all. <laughs> Unlike the Lucas, the Lucas which is, is very, bizarrely laid out. Very weirdly laid out. There are lower level dressing rooms. There's under the stage and the, the you know. And I have not spent a lot of time in those spaces. Um, and even last night, <laughs> we we had a, a film screening for the end of quarter for SCAD film students. And uh, there was a little friendly bat that made its <laughs> appearance <laughs> during the screening. Um, and I asked one of the tech people if they had had any experiences. And while they said that they hadn't seen anything, they did allude to the fact that there have been times where it, they were kind of creeped out because they didn't feel like they were alone um the only experience i've had in the lucas theater that was clearly kind of outside of you know the normal realms was i was trying to show someone what the theater looked like and we had gone all the way up into the projection booth which i have had heard stories from the projectionists say yeah we we operate as if we are not alone in that space um, and I was trying to find the master light to turn on the house lights. And I had no idea where it was. And then it was very clear to me that it was backstage right. And that was a very clear direction. Go backstage right. There's a switch on the wall. And lo and behold, there was a switch on the wall that said house lights. Boom. Turn the lights on. And incidentally, backstage right is where a lot of people have experiences. Yes. Mm-hmm. That area. Because um, we produced a couple of shows in the Lucas over the years and and um knowing that that whole area because there there's written on the floor the line of death you know uh, yes, for, yes. for the fly system <clears throat> and yes. so people naturally uh, automatically are thinking death <laughs> i'm back here yeah but that area i've i've heard many reports of people standing there and feeling like they're being crowded or like somebody's like walking up on them and then when they turn and look there's nothing there right that whole back area because there's like the Lucas has like a, a hallway that runs behind the wall. And so there's something about that wall that feels very yeah. unsteady, almost like the building might fall on you. <laughs> right. You know? And I mean, that is one of the original walls. I <laughs> right. Mean, you know, exactly. The, the the infrastructure of the Lucas is fairly sound and, oh, yes. you know, Absolutely. and well-maintained. Thank you, Scad. Um, and utilized often and so in conversations that i've had with people who have worked in theaters you know their life the most of their lives too the the common ideas are why are theaters so full of these you know spooks and spirits and you have the ghost light you know Mm -hmm. the the, the tradition of the ghost light and theaters that don't have the ghost light what does that mean (laughs) um Having been in a theater and work working and managing one through the pandemic, that ghost light became that beacon for us to be like, we're still here. And the League of Historic American Theaters, which is a consortium of historic theaters throughout <coughs> the um, the country, you know, focused on that ghost light and why and we leave it on. So for a... Uh a brief side note for anybody who doesn't know what a ghost light is. It is a light that is left on after the uh, theater basically closes. You leave it on overnight. Mm-hmm. And it's usually on stage or at least yep. you know just off stage. Um, and a lot of people uh, attribute it to the idea of satiating the ghost or keeping the ghost calm or, or doing things like that. Uh, there's a very practical reason to have it. It's because many people have to do a lot of work after hours and as they're closing up. Having that light on is very handy (laughs) when you're like a a, a stage crew person and you need to just run in and grab something. Because when you turn off the lights in a theater, (laughs) you are, well, and especially if it's a theater that changes its sets and has all these things, when you go out there, you could be running into things that you just aren't prepared for. No matter how many times you've walked through the stage, there could be rope on the ground. There could be, you know, props in the way. There could be set pieces in the way. Um, But the legend that has come, has, has always been, that the the spirits will get restless if they don't have some light shining on the stage, because that is their domain. Uh, and it, and we've said it many times in this mm-hmm. podcast: all theaters are haunted. Every single, yes. every yes. single theater, whether I, it was built last year or is built a yeah. hundred years ago, yeah. you know, all theaters are haunted. And if they're not 
something is amiss. <laughs> right. Something <laughs> is something definitely is scaring like, the ghosts away. Yeah. Yeah. Like I wouldn't say that trustees has zero ghostly activity, but we one don't have a ghost light, so we leave the lights on all the time. Right. But there was something about that renovation that after that nothing. it calmed it down and it, that's a rare or, or occurrence va- it, it right. felt like it was yeah. vacant and we we performed hamlet yeah we did in that space and nary ab- i mean like aside from you know me serving jeremiah hamlet uh actual, <laughs> <An> actual. <laughs> actual gin <laughs> poured gin into his cup oh, so yeah. which brings me to the idea of props and costumes um, Teresa Kaiser, who worked in the Savannah Arts Academy oh, right. in the auditorium, we talked about this, and you know she mentioned furniture and props and costumes that have come from various, you know, estates and stuff like that, and you know, spooky magical thing. You know, right. I mean, like Absolutely. things that having spirits attached. And there's to it. a long running urban legend that in the '60s, maybe even the '50s, but I think it was the '60s. Um, there was a suicide in the auditorium. Mm -hmm. Of Savannah Arts Academy. Of Savannah Arts Mm -hmm. Academy, um, which led to ghost stories. But that's exactly the kind of story that populates itself in in haunted locations. When people have strange things, there's only a few options for the story. Because there's that classic story of the person committing suicide and thereby haunts the place is is a tried and true urban legend. That, that, That fits it. But I do remember hearing that, like, gosh... 20 plus years ago mm. people talking about oh yeah um and what's interesting is i th- i think there's a like a bomb shelter under it's quite possible the uh under the savannah arts academy uh thing and um uh it used to flood all the time uh, <laughs> when it rained also quite possible, and yes. so it created yet another like that's just not where oh, you want to go yeah. jt just confirmed there is <laughs> yeah. a bomb shelter he, he went to savannah arts academy graduated he graduated yeah. from it. So yeah, there's there the way that stories populate themselves in these issues. Um, I went to uh, Armstrong when it was Armstrong State College. It's now Georgia Southern. Um, uh, at Armstrong State College, uh, Jenkins was the theater there, and we were in uh, the makeup dressing room. And uh, on the top of the costume rack were wig heads, and wig heads are creepy. There's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Wig heads are creepy. I'm putting my makeup on and I'm looking in the mirror and I'm seeing a wig head that is glaring at me. <laughs> it's just like, and I'm like, what a weird face to paint on a wig head. But because it's looking down and very severely at me in the mirror. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's <laughs> creepy. I'm, I'm creeped out. I can react. And, uh, and so finally, when I couldn't take it anymore, I turned and looked and it was one of those blank styrofoam faces. So no. yeah. So that no. night, I proposed that the men and women trade dressing rooms. <laughs> Thanks. And and uh, and for the rest of the time, we were in another dressing. Room. It was very kind of you. <laughs> I I know my business. Did the wig head have a wig on though? Uh, yes, it had a wig on. Even worse. Uh, so yeah, it had uh, and maybe not. A, it had a pillbox hat on, ah. and one of those pillbox hats that have a little veil like. Um, mm-hmm. But the wig head that I was looking at in the mirror had long brown hair. Uh, so it was very alarming. When you looked and there was no wig. And when I turned and looked and, and I even like kind of like maybe I was looking at another wig head. So, uh, you know, some angle action was happening. <laughs> I could never find a, a wig head that looked like the one that was looking at me. And, uh, and I was like, well, I'm done. I'm done with this room. I'm <laughs> That's a big no. This is no longer yeah. uh, the men's <laughs> costume area. Yeah. To that, um, one of the first directing gigs I had was Parchment High School. Um, the, one of the first shows that we did was A Little Shop of Horrors, which SCAD will be doing in the spring. Oh, yes. And that auditor- that space, again, Michigan, indigenous land, sure. stem to stem, yes, very much whole, so. the whole place. The feel and vibe of that auditorium, and it wasn't really big. There was There was something. There was something one of my friends who's rather clairvoyant was like, not coming to this play. I love you. I cannot go there. And I'm like, okay, whatever. But um, one particular evening, I was there alone after hours. It's late. 
Well, the other people in the building were custodial. And there was a little, like, janitor closet outside of the auditorium and, where there was a sink. And you know how you see things in your periphery? Like, you, you know, you did. And I remember, like washing something and looking up and there being like a severed head sitting on and i was like you do a double take and it's gone and it's just like cans of spray paint and, sure. stuff. and i'm like what did i just see so i went back into the theater and i'm trying to like put stuff away and the tones that are used to signify the end of class mm. they stop when school is over of course but of course <laughs> Middle of it's dead silent, and I hear one of these very long bleeding tones. And you know when something's amiss when all of the moisture gets sucked out of your mouth, and you can taste fear. Fear has a very metallic taste, and it was just one of those moments where I was like, I don't care about that paintbrush. I don't, it can dry. I, I'm done. We are, <laughs> I, I just grabbed my stuff, and I was like, I'm leaving now. I'm leaving. There was just something about that space, and I asked the custodians. I was like. Is this high school? Do you guys see, th hear things after hours? And they're like, oh, yeah, this place <laughs> is royally haunted. We hear, you know, high heel footsteps down hallways. You know, we stuff goes missing all the time. The, the tone will go off at random times, scare the snot out of us, door slam, locker slam, you know. And if you go on, I mean, a, a cursory glance online will find, you know, tons of footage of haunted schools and whatnot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So schools, you know, because there's so much collective energy. So that brings us to the idea of the collective energy of the performance and the applause and the actors and everything, you know. I mean, this is what goes, you know, thrive on and when Absolutely. it's all gone. Right? And there's, a, you know, the the idea, too, that so many ghosts, their their existence is predicated on the idea that they want life. You know that yeah. that that they that they want to be alive, and in a theater they have this opportunity to sit shoulder to shoulder with people, and they get this opportunity to focus on the same thing that everyone else is focusing mm -hmm. on. They get to participate, and that participation feels like being alive. And so you can see where even ghosts that are not associated with the theater, that didn't die in the theater or have anything to do with the theater, not they were not actors, they were not you know, yep. they are just. Following an energy, this vast energy, all this electric lights, all this electric performance, all these people reenacting life on stage. And you can sit and people aren't like all of a sudden going, oh, there's a ghost because shoulder to shoulder, we all feel safe. Yep. You know, um, I can only think of maybe once in my life when I was in a crowd and all of a sudden felt very isolated by a spirit. And that is it, so rare because spirits generally are... Um, dissipated by the number of people which is why we talk about don't take too many people on a ghost hunt because the more people you have on a ghost hunt the uh the more dissipated the the energy is for the ghost to try to communicate or try to get through Interesting. um so a lot of times when you get a large group of people in a ghost hunt you 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 kind of diminish the odds of contact because the ghost is trying <laughs> it's like there's so many people i need to get out to versus like focusing on the one person who is earnestly trying to find them yeah the um there one of the interesting spots that i think in a lot of theaters people experience activity are in the tech booths Mm -hmm. um, and it probably holds, you know, uh, a piece of the idea, you know, that all that electricity is feeding into them. I had a story one time when I was when I lived in Florida, I used to perform with this group out at, in Tarpon Springs. And it was a beautiful uh, performing arts center they had out there. If you live anywhere near there, go watch their productions they are always amazing. But we were doing a production of HMS Pinafore, the only opera I've ever done. Never will do it again. It was, <laughs> it's a bizarre a show. Gilbert and Solomon. Come yeah, on. <laughs> but, mm, but regardless. Um, so it was a very intense tech week for whatever reason. Um, and mostly it was because there was only one person doing all the tech for this show. That tracks. You know, yeah, yeah it that's, tracks. Um, and that's he pretty was kind of a, the course. Yeah. Right, and he was kind of an intense man in general. Um, also tracks. But we came in one time, and all of us were sitting on the stage waiting for everything rehearsal to get started, um, and we saw kind of a silhouette up in the tech booth from the stage, and we just assumed it was him. And 
Um, but he usually greeted people at the very least. But we thought it was weird. We're like, okay, he didn't say anything to anybody, but maybe he's busy on something. And then we hear from the tech booth, a guy come into the booth and start yelling at somebody to get away from the board. He was like, get away from the board. What are you doing? I've been working on this all week. And it literally just vanished. Oh, oh. my God. <laughs> yeah. And he also was never a believer in the paranormal, but he was like, I thought it was one of the actors who were up <laughs> in the tech booth just fiddling around with my stuff. I was about to absolutely lose my mind. You have to imagine uh, that a bunch of buttons and slides must be just irresistible to a ghost. Uh, right. like, oh, do you see this? Look at this button. Look at this. <laughs> Look at all glows. Buttons, yes. buttons and slides. Yes. So in the funny thing, so the the theater that I managed in Michigan recently, um, we actually had the Southern Michigan Paranormals or SMP with Dan Holroyd come and do a, an investigation there because during the pandemic, I was the only one allowed in the building. Um, I lived like I could see the theater from my apartment. That it's a different story. I really, really don't recommend that. But um, so I would go to work every day, but I was the only one in this, this very large building. It had a 960 plus seat auditorium that was built. It was built in 54. It opened in 55. And it also had an adjacent ballroom space and lower level that used to be the youth center because across the street was the high school. And it was during the pandemic when lights on stage and we did not have a ghost light. This is when the lights started talking to us. Oh, and hopefully we Which, can. I was yeah. going to say um, <laughs> we're, we're, we can save because you have video, right? Oh, I do have video, and, yeah, and, so, and I've shared it with you too. Yeah, in the future we will um, we will dedicate a show to it because there is so um, much to talk about. a lot to talk about yes. at that location. But it is a classic theater ghost situation. It's although this so was brilliant. the just the sheer communicability of these spirits. Deserves a, oh, an entire episode. Yes, and <laughs> so, we want we want so we Dan to, to Sheila join back. Us. We'll try to get Dan to come yes. down and or or at the very least zoom in. Yeah, um, to talk about uh, that experience. But um, using electronics to communicate, which is one of the biggest things that is going on in in the ghost hunting world, is using spirit boxes, using yep. uh, our uh, REM pods, using these things. Um, it doesn't just derive from people messing with these things. It's because people have for a long time been able to do things like, you know, see a flickering light and be like, is that you? And then the light would flicker. And, yes. And that is a long standing communication tool. You know, um, one of the hardest ones to to um, to accept is the knocks. Uh, because mm -hmm. of the rampant misuse of the knocks, right? Yeah. You know the knocks uh, uh, got such a bad rap. So it, huh. if, <laughs> uh, if 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 it does happen, there are too many charlatans who use the knocks uh, to to fool people. That that's no longer an acceptable mm. form of communication. Um, light manipulation is a lot different. You know, because usually you can trace that, you know, wires go, they go somewhere. Yes. You know, you can find out if there's somebody standing at a light switch moving it uh, right. or things like that, um, which is why you actually see in a lot of ghost shows now, they'll put like um, loose flashlights down and have the lights brighten and dim or go off and come on. Um, so, yeah, uh, with that in mind, uh, let's save that for. Right. For, a for another, show. for another, it's own show. But, but yeah, the idea that during the pandemic, when all of these theaters went dark, what happens to the ghosts? What happens to the spirits? They go you know? starving, and they, <laughs> they are, and they, and it became very apparent that it needed attention. And the more attention we directed to it, the more communicative it became. I would love for you to tell us some of the experiences you've had in the Savannah Theater because I have very So we actually have an time. episode where I told the, yeah. the Savannah <laughs> Theater did. stories. Okay. But um, suffice it to say that the Savannah Theater was a reliable, constant haunt. And the more you get into the idea that, you know, uh, the sheer volume of people, we're talking audience members, actors on stage, Everybody was having experiences. Um, uh, 
Betty is the ghost that we call the woman on stage. Um, Betty was seen by so many people over the years. Um, a woman in a, almost an antebellum gown uh, on stage. Uh, sometimes she'll show up like a wisp of smoke. Audience members saw her. Actors saw her. It was such a normal thing. Um, there's a boy, uh, Benjamin, in the uh, balcony. People have experience of touch. He's a kinetic spirit, so people feel like tugs on their clothes, tugs on their hair. Uh, the sensation of being teased, really, is, is, is Benjamin's thing. And then there's somebody that for a long time was called the director. Uh, and it was because he shouted. <laughs> And he, he would shout things. Sometimes he would be like very complimentary. Bravo. Hey. Sometimes he'd be like, get off the stage. <laughs> and, and to the point at which uh, we used to, whenever we'd hear this voice, we'd run people through the building because it's easy for a homeless person to get into the building while you're uh, rehearsing. Yeah. Right. Because there's a whole front area and the front area actually has a stairwell up into the balcony system that if you're not in the lobby, you will not see someone come in through the door. So we would constantly be like, I think there's someone up there, run up and see. Um, never was there someone up there. Ew. But you always did because it was so solid a sound. It was not something where you're like, I thought I heard something. It was like, there's a man up there. <laughs> um, and uh, and all of those stories uh, came to a, 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 a an eventual explanation. Everybody kind of was like, there was a boy who died in the 50s on stage, uh, not on stage, um, on the, in the fire exit on the second floor balcony. Uh, a woman died on stage in a fire in like the 1820s. And, um, and then the projectionist had a heart attack and ultimately died. They like to say that he died in the building, but there's no like guarantee that that's what happened. But he was he worked there regularly. So, you know, there's all kinds of stories about that. But those three ghosts, when I first arrived in Savannah in 1993 and started working at the Savannah Theater, they told me those stories. They told me right away, well, there are three ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, in the earliest iteration, the child and the woman were linked as mother and child. And I think they thought they said it was a girl, a little girl and, and the mother, which is natural. If you see a child and you see a woman, people will naturally like try to make that the story. It's like, oh, they're a family that, that went. And then um, everyone thought that it was the owner of the theater, that the Weiss ghost, Mr. Weiss. There's a lot of that because he would, he would be wearing like a, uh, a red jacket with gold buttons. Is, is, people would see this man with red jacket and gold buttons. But then later people were like, you know, that's more like an usher's uniform. You know, right. that's more like, yeah. Yeah, I don't think that, I don't think a fancy man, you know, outside of P.T. Barnum <laughs> is going to show up <laughs> in a bright red jacket with gold buttons. But um, one of my favorite encounters with that character, uh, which we later learned was named George and we started calling him George, um, was uh, we were doing a show and one of the actresses was just up in the balcony, like minding her own business. And she noted that there's a man in a red jacket standing behind her. And when she saw him, she's like, oh, got to go. <laughs> and she just left. Not in the sense of, uh, oh, it's a ghost, but like, oh, I'm not supposed to be up here. Uh. Um, when, when she asked, we were like, no, there's nobody. You know, th that description does not fit. Uh, several of the actors went up to investigate, and they found a gold button. <laughs> oh, no. And it was like, oh, this is like an old blazer button. And it was. It was an antique like wow. shiny golden button. Put it back. Yeah. Put it back. I don't know what happened to that button. <laughs> <laughs> so with the Savannah Arts Academy going back to the auditorium, asking permission or like just acknowledging the, your theatrical spirits. Like, you know, I said when I would work overnight so many, so many times working overnight by myself in the theater, I acknowledge you, leave me alone. Um, Teresa Kaiser said, we had to ask permission to use the space. And if we didn't, the ghost in the tech booth would uh. mess stuff up and turn lights on during the performance that weren't part of the performance. Oh, so, wow. you know, and, and when they were leaving, it was important that they all acknowledge and let the ghost know that he would have his theater back. Right. And that's, uh, and I, uh, we've spoken about this on this podcast before. A lot of times addressing a spirit is the best way to minimize its activity. Right. Because they're looking for your attention. And if you give it to them freely, they don't have to bother you for it. So if you can, if you can acknowledge them right away, uh, they will be, they will reserve their energy. 
Um, the counter to that is, what are they saving that energy up for? Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, after a few years of, of them not having to present themselves, they might be buff. You know, <laughs> a beefy ghost. A beefy ghost. <laughs> They're like, whoa, do we even lift, bro? <laughs> no, uh, Sheila, we do have a few questions that have sure. come in from the para junkies. Um, so I'm going to read some of them to you. But... Uh, Alexis asks, is naming a ghost a good idea, like theater ghost? <laughs> it, I mean, again, acknowledging their presence, a lot of times they will tell you who they are. You know, case in my former theater, <laughs> I had photo evidence of this person and knew who that was. So by acknowledging them and getting confirmation from the spirit box that that's who it was, you know, I mean, it it always helps to have something to refer to them as, you know. Absolutely. Just be careful when identifying a spirit that you're not identifying them maliciously. Right. Like, you know, if you identify a spirit out of fear, you see a, a spirit and you're like, ah, it's a monster. It very well could be trying to assume the uh, presence that you are telegraphing that you are mm. you're you're communicating uh, you know you're like i see the devil and it's like oh, okay, okay yeah. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you need the devil i can be devilish right. um but uh in yeah in the cases where they're identifying themselves what they want is a continued existence as who they were in life and oftentimes um they get most active when they're being forgotten yeah you know when when there's when there's little hope of people remembering who they were they can become very active in hopes of garnering someone's recognition. Yep. And once they have that recognition, they can usually behave themselves. They can usually, you know, um, however, once you do recognize them, they, they can get pushy, <laughs> get yeah. very pushy. Exactly. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. You know, <laughs> don't, don't name them demon boy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know? But a lot of times too, people like spirits will give you their name eventually if they want you to know that. Otherwise, you can also be aware of spirits that don't identify themselves. Right. That is true. That is that, that is one true. of the key uh, recognition of a malicious spirit is that they want their identity to be concealed, and malicious spirits will also lie about who they are. So there's a lot of a lot of issues about uh about names because then then you're really stepping into um demonology 101 sure. knowing names sharing names uh the names are powerful and they and they have purpose so uh yeah that's that's an excellent question that has a lot of answers <laughs> <laughs> yes. and uh the next question comes from anonymous what would you say is the most haunted theater in savannah Probably the Savannah, Savannah Theater. Theater yeah. Yeah. Would, my, would, 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 would be my, my, my guess. Did City Lights have any ghosts, do you recall? So the original City Lights on York Lane Theater had a ghost that they called Helen. Uh, and the story was that this woman fell th down the elevator shaft, which is now the basement of the All Factory uh, oh, right. that, that tracks. So, so <laughs> that makes the, sense. The, um, the All Factory store is, is, is a... Um, sort of a new age and uh, haunted item store um, that purports a lot of haunted activity and a lot of the people who work there do not want to go into the basement. Um, so uh, the stories of that ghost, though, was it was interesting because uh, my sister, Jin Hee, was the um, uh, house manager of that theater company. And in order to turn the lights off, you had to go upstairs around the corner, turn the lights off, and then you had to walk through the upstairs, down a rickety staircase, all the way through the house to get out in the dark. Nope, like and that's the and again, that's, <laughs> that's why the ghost light becomes handy, but they didn't have a ghost light. You turned off the lights, and then you walked, and uh, more than once, uh, Jinhee had walked through, and she felt a hand on her back, and it felt like the hand was just guiding her, you know, just like a, a gentle... You know, be careful. You know, here we go. And and she found a lot of comfort in that spirit. And um, and I don't know that the name of of the woman who died or or anything about that, but I know that that the name Helen came about somewhere in in the storytelling. And people just kind of accepted that that was the name. 
Yeah. I Well, I would say the Savannah Theater as well, but I think that's mostly because it's the most active out the, of... The most stories and the most right. developed stories. And um, that doesn't mean much, but, but there's actual newspaper articles from like the late 1800s of police reports of ghostly activity inside the Savannah Theater. There's like um, uh, a, a great article where police were called into the theater uh, late one night because they people heard a, a applause, like a group oh, of a yeah. people, and they were like, somebody's in the theater. and But it wasn't just like one or two people. It was like a full audience. Um, and a lot of people here singing. People have heard singing from inside the theater, and some people are walking by the theater here singing through the doors. Um, that's a little trickier because it is a working theater and there's no telling who's in there rehearsing at what right. time and what hour. But right. many people hear the singing and, and immediately assume that it is a ghost. Yeah. I've met multiple people who have experienced that applause yeah. um, sensation where they're like in the bathroom and they just hear like a ton of applause, but nobody's in the theater. And I'm like, <laughs> well, that, yep. that's, that's a... That's a nice residual haunting. A ghost yes. crowd. <laughs> right, Ooh. a ghost audience. That's that's uh, I even think that was the the headline of uh, it was ghost audience at the Savannah Theater. Very yeah. interesting. Um, Mark asked, "What is the creepiest thing that has happened to you in a theater?" Oh, la la la. Um when you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. With Uber Reserve, good things come to those who plan ahead. Family vacay? Reserve your ride as soon as you book your flights. To all the planners, now you can reserve your Uber ride up to 90 days in advance. See Uber app for details. Probably, oh, so just a little teaser on my former theater. Once the spotlight kind of established that it would turn itself on and we were we referred to this person as ed who worked in the space um the maintenance guy had mentioned to me that he also had seen it and i was standing in the back of the theater the theater the auditorium was completely dark completely dark and i just whispered i can see you and the spotlight came on Hmm. And I was like, hey, you could see me too, and I'm going to go home now. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> so, and that kind of started this whole like. Yeah, whenever you have direct response, it, it, it is right. oh, it's so chilling. responsive. It's very chilling. Very, very responsive. I cannot wait to see this video. <laughs> <laughs> that we I might, don't we, have video we, of. Yeah. But we, we might need to plan a trip up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, that would be so cool. That really would. Um, and the, Ashley Werner uh, asks, is the Tybee Post Theater haunted? Maybe. To we did a show understand, there, too. It was the same show, Hamlet. Yeah, it was the same show. <laughs> um, all all, all theaters, theaters are, are haunted. haunted. And if TikTok's um, going to love that. Well, <laughs> even more intriguing is the history of the, the, uh, the Post Theater. And the reason why it's called the Post Theater was because it was actually on a military base. Um, and so that whole area of Tybee was a militarized uh, area, and that was the theater of the post. It was, you know, it, so it was it was there. So while I've never heard any reports of it, I would not doubt it for a second yeah. that it was haunted. Um, one of the weird things about like beach hauntings or beach uh, property hauntings is is kind of the um, one of the most common things is they're not as interactive. Mm -hmm. Like when you think of beach hauntings, they're usually something you see. It's usually something that, you know, uh, they, they, I think they just like being at the beach. They're so, beach bum ghosts. <laughs> yeah, <you know. laughs> they're, they're pretty low energy in that regard. Um, but we did not have anything strange. Yeah. I'm trying to think of, of the time we, cause we, it's, it's a box. It is, yeah. it is not nearly Zero wing space. no wings, wow. no anything. So, you know, every bit of it is exposed from the moment you walk in uh, to include like the light 
booth is just a balcony, you know, yeah. so it's it's a very fascinating space. I would like to do an investigation out there because the, that question, you know, bears uh, investigation. But because our general consensus belief is that spirits, many spirits are homeless. Many spirits do not have a, a, a purpose, quote unquote purpose. They just want to, they just can't let go. They can't, they can't move on. There's some reason for that. So going to places where people gather makes sense. Going to places where the living gather makes sense. That's why, um, and conversely, a lot of ghosts will not go into churches because it is believed in their lifetime that spirits are not allowed in churches. And so they are, they're usually adhering to rules of their own making. So there's a lot of ghosts that will not go onto Holy Land. They will not go into uh, right. only because of a conditioning, not necessarily because there's some some truth to the idea that they can't go in. It's just if you if you encounter a ghost in a church, it's usually someone essential to the church. It's usually somebody who worked at the church, somebody who had a, a lot of heart in a church. So you don't get that that same homeless notion of ghosts that you get in like stadiums. Stadiums are very haunted. Um, hmm. Theaters are very haunted. Um, public gathering places, very haunted. The next question comes from Stephanie Wesson. Uh, any other theaters you know are haunted that aren't in Savannah or Michigan? Yeah, so <laughs> every state has at least one. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one year I did go to the League of Historic American Theaters, they had a specific theater in Kentucky, and I can't remember the name of the theater, but they capitalized on their very, very haunted uh, space. So just a quick cursory glance, you know, haunted theaters in Colorado, haunted theaters in Kentucky. Haunted, Absolutely. And, and you will get a list. Every state has, I mean, there's a ton in Detroit, you know, every, and part of it is we who work in theaters, we recognize our resident haunts and we want to share that with people. Oh, absolutely. And we want people yes. to know these stories and know the history. So it's it's really easy. Throw a stone, you will find a haunted theater, you'll find the stories. You yeah, yes. and, and like we said, every, every theater has a ghost and usually when you talk to the people who've worked these theaters or, you've, or, or around them, they have a, a good intimate knowledge. Of the kind of haunting. Uh, I know there's a, 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 a very haunted uh, theater in Dahlonega, Georgia. Um, the Fox oh, Theater yes. in Atlanta very. is is very yeah. haunted. And in the case of the Fox Theater, that seems to be kind of a compression point, too, because it's been such a celebrated theater for so long that it almost becomes uh, compulsory to go to the Fox Theater. Right. <laughs> so even after you're dead, you're like, hey, let's go to the Fox. Oh, yeah, 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 right. Theaters oh. of, that have been restored, like the Fox Theater in Detroit. Oh, yeah. Where mm -hmm. you know, it went through huge renovations. You know, it doesn't always lose its ghost like trustees, you know, which, again, trustees may or may not have a ghost. It just, there's not a lot of things for well, it to kind of manifest. The interesting thing about it, too, is the concept of whether there's a ghost or not also comes down to what the ghost wants. Right. There is a chance that during the last renovation of the theater, something satisfied the ghost. Mm -hmm. The ghost no longer felt that it needed to present itself in a way, you know, something mm -hmm. moved that was bothering the ghost. Something was, you know, uh, maybe there was a wall that he that was uh, not to his liking or maybe the, the, the seating arrangement. Maybe they added more seats or they took away seats. Any number of things can – because if a ghost is around going – I'm here because of uh, an energy flow issue, and then you fix the energy flow, which renovations often do, the spirit can kind of calm down. It doesn't mean it went away. It just means it no longer needs to try yeah. to get your attention and be like, hey, fix right. this. Fix yeah. this. Do you see this? <laughs> it's <laughs> a <laughs> mess. <laughs> yeah, all the seats were removed and replaced so, right. with brand right. new seats. So. Which is, uh, is kind of interesting, too, to think about uh, – if you're really attached to a, a place and the thing you're really attached to leaves, you might be like, oh, I really love those seats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I sat down yeah. when I was alive. And if, you're, oh, yeah, if you're a para junkie, um, go back to November when JT and I went to Maysville because I think we posted about it. Um, my grandmother lives in Maysville, Kentucky, very small town. It's where Rosemary Clooney and George Clooney are from. Um, but they have an opera house there where one of their actresses is buried in the dressing room. Yeah. Gracious Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So <Cool. laughs> if you want to hear about a haunted theater, go right? watch that. Um, 
But next question, we only have a couple more left. Uh, comes from Frenchie. Will the ghost light lessen or worsen activity? I I I don't I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I know speaking from experience, not having a ghost light definitely increased the activity of yes, the former theater. Sure. The general consensus is without a ghost light, you get more calamity. Yes. Um, and I I dare say that that has been my experience in life too. Is like the ghost light tends to keep issues at a minimum. If you keep a light on, um, and maybe that's just simple, you know, dynamics of when the lights are out, more things can go wrong. And and so when the lights are on, because like uh, my my worst experience in the Savannah Theater happened while we were producing um, To Kill a Mockingbird uh, to the point at which like I was building a set with only one hand screwdriver because we had lost every other tool. <laughs> And so no. I was like, I'm like screwing screws into a flat with my hand. And it was so weird. The dress rehearsal night, the set wasn't painted because it was slow going. Um, at the center of the stage was a bucket full of all of our tools. <laughs> and we didn't have a ghost light. Um, the guy who was helping me, uh, Jake, um, we used to go in. And the way the Santa, Savannah Theater is set up um, when it's daylight out, the actual theater is still very dark. And we used to walk in to to start construction. We'd walk in, we'd open the doors, and we would see a light on the stage go away. Huh. And we used to always think it was a car driving by. That's what we told ourselves. Sure. And we were fine with that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> There's always some kind of explanation. Exactly. So get you a ghost light, even yeah. if it's from Walmart. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Just put a wall. Just put a little, little light up. Light up. Light up. Um, and then the last question comes from Monique. Are there any specific productions that heighten activity? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> Usually, any kind of production, any kind of movement, any kind of activity, you'll especially with tools. If there, it, you will something things will happen because there was a a performance of I think they were doing the Beverly Hillbillies and one of the gentlemen came to me and said, "Can I ask you a question?" <laughs> and I was like, "Shoot!" And he was like, "Do you believe in ghosts?" And I was like, oh, "Okay, I know where this is going." And so part and that's how I met Dan from oh, Southern sure. Mystery Paranormal. But but it's that idea that. We are on stage and the lights are doing wild things. Right. There's yes. so much activity going on. Do you believe that this place? I mean, again, theater directors who say, oh, no, I don't believe in ghosts or no, my theater's not haunted are lying or <laughs> lying to themselves. Sure. And absolutely. it really, I mean, there's no harm in acknowledging that your space is haunted and that, you know, that there are stories attached to the space that you're in, you know. Although so. I will say that um, when you do classic work, like if you're performing Shakespeare, what you're actually doing is you're reciting words that thousands upon thousands of people have recited before. You are participating in an ongoing ritual of performance. And that ritual of performance does carry with it sort of a stepping into and, and it's one of the um, the joys of acting is for a brief period of time you're a hundred five hundred years old you're saying the words and that is a type of magic that is indelible so whenever you are producing or performing something and whenever you're doing something by rote um, when you do a, a Shakespearean performance you are doing something that is recognizable for 400 years you are doing something that um, that people could have been exposed to at any era, and that could stir up a lot of activity because those spirits are recognizing something from their life when they were alive. For 400 years, people have heard of Romeo and Juliet. They have heard of the Scottish play. They have heard of Hamlet. And when you do and produce those things, there is a chance that you are creating an era cue for them because you have not – altered these words enough for them to um, to be erased from the collective memory of spirits. 
or well, and with some of Shakespeare's work, you're literally doing yeah. a ritual. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, our literal rituals. <laughs> okay, so you know, um, but I would agree with that sentiment that some productions uh, feel familiar. You know, and that's actually a tactic sometimes people use in investigations where they'll play music from a certain era um, that they think the spirits would connect with. Um, Reading from the Bible, yeah, because the Bible is such a a time honored. T- a tome that people are familiar with. It's not because I'm using the holiness of it. It's because I'm using the familiarity of it. You could probably do it with Dickens, but the Bible sold more than Dickens. So, <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think ghosts just in, who haunt theaters just want attention to Absolutely. begin with. So <laughs> yes, they don't. Yes, really, the humans who go to theaters. Yes, just exactly. Want attention, so. <laughs> so I don't know if uh, a particular play will particularly uh, stir people up as much but if they're there and they want attention they're going to find a way Uh, that's really the sum of it but um, Sheila thank you so much thank you so much for having me we are really just happy that you came in today and Love told us fun. all your stories. And we are definitely going to have to set up that second yes. um, episode where you can talk all about this video. And yes. So, yes. Um, but thank you all so much for listening to today's episode. We hope that you enjoyed. Uh, if you had a, a good time and you want to join us for more, you can find us over on Patreon, like we said before. Um, we're under the Savannah Underground over on Patreon. Uh, if you don't follow us on social media already, you can find us on under all platforms under Haunted City Podcast. Uh, But with that, my name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And stay spooky, y'all.